Thank you all for joining me this edition for Author's Hour on Maryland's Bookstore, EDC 466. It's always an honor and a thrill to host these hours for the people I get to speak with. Tonight, listeners get excited. I certainly am. We'll be addressing a current push in American schools for the focus on literacy of myriad modes of information. Specifically, you are all might agree here that we all are young readers and there's a wealth of visual imagery for which we're asking you to be accountable. It's everywhere. We know it from your Facebooks to the Snapchats we know you're sending each other during class to the media that we ask you to cite for class and even just the way that information is conveyed. Think about the media. Think about the news hours. It used to be way back in the days that text dominated informational flyers with perhaps a singular image that was meant to only attract you. But the last piece, whose attention we're hoping to grab, that part has shifted focus away from the textual communication and opened up to this wider audience for whom English or massive amounts of information conve conveyed via words is not actually the most accessible language. Literacy rates around the country have plummeted partly as a result of this. Arguably, and perhaps our authors on tonight's show can advocate for this, there are still genres of text that may be, even as verbal literacy rates decrease, that these forms of new text or that have always been here, this kind of writing has become even more powerful, not only for those reading and studying it, but indeed for those who are also writing it. Listeners, I'd like to introduce to you all Dr. Angela Wiseman, whose work on adolescent literacy through poetry. Now kids, don't turn us off. Poetry isn't old white men in puffy shirts anymore. Later on, we'll discuss how poetry already exists in your worlds, actually, so really do hang on. This work by Dr. Angela Wiseman is absolutely fascinating. Angela, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. <clears throat> My pleasure, absolutely. So let's get right to it. Why? And I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone, and especially my young listeners who are reading, or maybe reading a transcript later on. Should we care about poetry, and why should we even bother to teach it? Great question, Rachel, and everyone, I'll be direct. Poetry writing in the classroom has the potential to encourage complex engagement and inter integrate knowledge that results from various life experiences since it involves creative language and multiple perspectives. When students are provided with opportunities to write about topics that resonate with them and use their own ways of thinking about the world, their educational experiences and literacy learning are enhanced. Poetry, specifically, can provide a way for students to communicate topics that bridge their personal knowledge with the school curriculum through metaphor, imagery, and creative expression. You know these well. Furthermore, poetry can introduce the understanding that comes from being engaged in multiple contexts, cultures, and identities, where both the students and the teachers themselves contribute to the curriculum and communicate their learning. Wow, what great points, Dr. Wiseman. Perhaps you could stay on the line for a minute further. We have teacher Stephen Wolk, who is a fifth grade teacher at Baker Demonstrative School in Evanston, Illinois, and he uses poetry workshops in his classes all the time, and he's on the line. Oh, sure. Stephen and I go way back. Grand. So just bear with me while I bring him up. So, hey, Mr. Wolf, thanks for calling in. I'm sure listeners are all eager to hear your, you know, after Dr. Wiseman's pontificating here and how this owl actually might play out in their classrooms, or let's say if it does. Oh, I can already hear Angela chomping at the bit there. Of course. So my classroom loves poetry, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, when we first started, many of my students stopped paying attention and I was at a loss for us how to regain their interests. My really powerful switch actually came when we opened up the curriculum to spend time reading poetry written by them and for them, as opposed to those big names in the canon. Oh yes, perfect. It seems so ironic to me. If I mean, if we think about really what it is that we want to teach here when we say that we're teaching English, what we're trying to convey is conversation, is speech, is voice, right? Exactly, Rachel. 
Of all the experiences that our class engages in, it is our immersion into poetry in our writing workshop that I see as one of the greatest outlets for middle school voices. From our first day together and throughout the year, I tell them and I do not want them to write for me that their teacher is their not intended audience. Rather, I tell them that they should write for themselves. And then I walk over to our window, point outside, and tell them that they should write for our world. I tell them what they are thinking, caring, and that they are intelligent human beings. All of this is important and valid, and that they have important things to say, and that they have a right to be heard. Just because you're 11 doesn't mean you're not a person. <clears throat> yes, exactly. Oh, Angela, here we go. And poetry, now, Stephen, let's agree here. Poetry, despite all of its conventions, is actually partly because of maybe all of those conventions, is really a level playing field for emergent writers and readers to test out their developing voices. Because, oh, yes, well, look, Angela, can I just jump in here? Oh, sure, Rachel, sure. So I completely agree because when we teach poetry, it's a novel concept, but the, the language we're asking them to use is their own. Yeah, I like this. This makes sense to me. All right, well, now I have a new question for both of you here. Are either of you familiar with the study done on poetry by professors at the University of Carolina at Charlotte? Oh, Furman and Langer, who tried to quantitatively assess the qualitative data inherent in poetry? Oh, yes, yes, of course, Rich and Carol. They really pioneered as best they could that empirical work to validate what so many teachers and students know from personal experience can be powerful methods for instruction and learning. Right, well, okay, so clearly you both are. Uh, I have their study here, and I'd like to share it with listeners so we can frame the rest of our talk a bit in a formalized background. But I can already anticipate callers later in the show commenting that poetry may be all good and well, but can we actually take the place, can it actually take the place of formalized, often wrote memorization of instruction of vocab and literary tools and criti critical analysis? So here's what it sounds like, a heck yes. According to these researchers, much, uh, much as a performance scholar uses their performance to embody the experience under study and thus more fully understand it, poetic responses let us more fully understand the intimate experiences of the topic under study. In this way, they claim, the writing itself becomes a method of inquiry as we examine the meanings in the first set of poems through our own thoughts, feelings, and memories, which, as we have talked earlier in EDCI 466 readers and listeners, you'll remember, that is one of those reader response opportunities. But back to this study here. The poetic autobiography adds to the qualitative turn that blurs the line between social sciences and the humanities, bringing rigorous inquiry to the life of, with evocative texts. So thank you all for joining me thus far in the show. We've heard from two scholars and one teacher, and it, they've brought some really interesting perspectives. But let's go ahead and reach out to some of these really cool authors who are writing for this, um, this new push here for literacy in myriad forms. But most specifically, I'd like to highlight, readers and listeners get excited, it's Kwame Alexander! So joining me here is Mr. Cameron, and we're going to talk with him and Alexander about his work, The Crossover. And how did the title for the story come about? What does The Crossover mean? Well, I knew I wanted to write a book that boys would be excited about, would be interested in, and so I tried to create a story that was going to be framed around basketball because, you know, when I was young, I, if I was going to read something, it was going to have something to do with sports. Um, and so the crossover is a move in basketball. It's a move where you take one, uh, you take the ball from one hand and you cross it over to the other in order to fool or to trick the defender. And so that's where I started. But of course, it's also a coming of age story about two boys, about twin brothers. So it's about their crossover or their crossing over from boyhood into manhood. And I'm curious about the actual structure of the story. So um, it's very poetic in a lot of ways. It visually moves a lot around the page. And um, what were your choices for including those elements in the story? 
Yeah, if I could just add too, it's really interesting that there's this push with young readers to start publishing as um, novels in verse poems. And I think that's a really interesting move in terms of broadening its reader appeal, you know, Kwame. So could you speak to that a little bit as well? Mom says, your dad's old school, like an old Chevette. You're fresh and new, like a red Corvette. Your game's so sweet, it's crepe Suzette. Each time you play, it's all net. Mm. I knew that this book had to be poetry. When you think of basketball, when you think of you know, Carmelo, when you think mm -hmm. of LeBron, when mm -hmm. you think of these awesome basketball players, and you see them on the court, it's like poetry in motion. The oh, way they yes. move, the way they pass, the way they dunk the ball. And so I thought that poetry would be the best way to capture that energy from the court on the page. That's so true. That is so true. Also, I realized that when you look at poetry on the page, it's not a lot of words. It's a lot of white space. And so even the most reluctant reader is going to be interested in picking up this book, perhaps, because they're not going to be too intimidated by all the ink on right. the page. That's so true. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. That was great. Let's see if we can bring another author in, readers. Have, you, have any of you heard of Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson? Well, if you haven't, you're probably going to have to go to the library right after the show. Um, but Jacqueline, you wrote a really interesting novel in verse form as well as Kwame. And you had a different reason for, for talking about the story that you did. It seemed to have a lot to do with your family and, and how... How, do you, how does your work as an author, or, or sort of why, why tell your story this way, and perhaps not as um, a piece of music, or why not just talk about it? You know, why, why turn it into a novel in verse poems? I think the thing I try to do as a writer is bring worlds to the page. And I think what happens with readers is they step inside those worlds and they experience them in a way that they might not in their real life. And so it gives them a chance to think about a bigger society and the mm. greater good. I mean, absolutely. the constant question kids ask themselves is, if I if it was me, what would I do? Mm -hmm. How would I how mm -hmm. would I engage with the who would how would I treat the Jesus boy? How would I treat Sean? Who sure. would I be? Sure. Would I be Franny or would I be someone else in this? Or Madeline is her name Samantha. Sorry, so <laughs> in the funny. story. Good to um, know your characters. And and by the time they get to the end of the mm -hmm. book, the ask, the asking of what happens next, what happens next, and yes. and my question always to young people is, well, what do you think happens next? So what would, it hap what would happen if it was your story or if you were one of these characters? Um, Absolutely. You know, and that's a great point in terms of how do we keep readers engaged? Because far too many students just, you know, we assign something and, and they do it, but are they engaged? And I think that, that opening up the characters for people to really get invested in from the get-go, or even maybe introducing a character, you know, midway to catch those readers who might be dozing off and not catching all the great nuances. We we want to give them opportunities to drop in, to drop into this different world so that they can then experience their own more fully. Wow. Thank you, Miss Woodson, for joining us. That was great. So, re readers and listeners, I'd like you all just to stay in here for one last minute. You know the last thing that I always do on Author Hour is make sure that you kiddos, you get to recommend books to each other. So here we have, in the topic of poetry and literacy and all that, here we have one of you guys calling in to recommend a book for you all to go out and read. So, again... Kwame Alexander, The Crossover, your library has it. Amazon Prime has it. You could be reading it tonight under the covers, and Mom and Dad would be A-OK -okay with that, and it's not like homework. Or you could check out something a little bit more historically relevant. You could go up and look for Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming. Or we've got one more, and it talks about stuff that happens in the schoolyard. Yo, now, now don't laugh. Um, but here's one of your peers recommending something for you. Okay, on the line. Here you go, kiddo. Take it away. What are we reading? Oh, Rhyme Schemer. Okay. 
Time Schemer is about a kid named Kevin who refers to himself as Stone and is a bully to other children because he doesn't get any attention from his parents. Okay, slow down. Tables turn and children start to bully him. And he Ooh. finds his way through poetry. Soon, he meets the library, Mrs. Little, and goes to a poetry night with her. I feel like this book is important because poetry can help not only your mind, but your personal problems too. This also shows that people can change when they find something in life that they value. All right. Thanks, kiddo. That was great. So that one, The Rhyme Schemers, is by K.A. Holt. That's H-O-L-T. So write it down or type it on a little note on your phone, guys, and check it out from your local library. So this concludes another author's hour, and I just want to say thank you all for calling in and for all your feedback and the support that you give us is really remarkable, and none of this would be possible without Dr. Grove. So everyone, shout out to Dr. Grove. Thank you. All right, take care, world.